Before I jump into the sermon, I thought you might be interested in knowing Jack Whitley caught me right before the early service this morning and, and gave me a final count on the holiday festival. Uh, and we, uh, the, the final number for that was $80,000. You raised $80,000 for uh, Habitat for Humanity. Isn't that great? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Those are the words that Mark uses to begin his story of the redemptive work of Christ. Those are the words Mark uses. Let me ask you a question. Suppose you were given the privilege and the responsibility of writing the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. How do you think you would begin it? Personally, I think if it were me, I might have begun it the way that Matthew or Luke begins it. Matthew and Luke, you remember, begin the story of the good news of Jesus Christ by telling of his birth. Matthew through the eyes of Joseph and, and Luke through the eyes of Mary. Matthew tells us about Joseph's struggle with the news that Mary was expecting a child. And then of the reassuring word of the angel. Luke tells us of angelic appearances in the little town of Bethlehem, of shepherds and, and of heavenly choirs. I like that. I think that's a good way to begin the story of the good news of Jesus Christ, don't you? I think I might have even been tempted to begin it, much the way that the Gospel of John begins it. John, you remember, is written in a distinctively different way than all of the other Gospels. He begins his Gospel by taking us all the way back to the dawn of creation and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then just a few verses later, he tells us that this word who we know is Christ became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and full of truth. Now that's a little bit more spiritualized of a way to begin it, but it's still a good way to begin the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. I, I think I might have been tempted to begin the story in either of those ways. I'm also pretty sure it would never have occurred to me to begin the story of the good news of Jesus Christ the way that Mark begins it. How does Mark begin it? No sooner does Mark tell us that he's going to tell us the story of the good news of Jesus Christ than he takes us out into the desert. He has no word about Mary or Joseph or the little town of Bethlehem. He says nothing about the dawn of creation. Instead, only three verses into his, his gospel, and we are suddenly standing in the middle of a desert. And not just any desert, but one of the most brutal and terrible deserts in the entire world, the limestone desert between Judea and the Dead Sea. We're told that the rock in that area would get blistering hot, and in the Old Testament, it is referred to as the Jeshemun, the devastation. Now, why? Why do you suppose Mark begins a story of the good news of Jesus Christ by first taking us out into the middle of a desert? Well, perhaps. Perhaps he does it because Mark knows that the desert is a pretty good description of where many people find themselves in life. Certainly this was true in, in Mark's day. Uh, in Mark's day, the Jews had revolted against Rome. The city of Jerusalem was under siege. The world was in turmoil. And people were filled with fear and anxiety and uncertainty. They may not have lived in the desert physically. They may have lived in the city physically. But spiritually and emotionally, they were in the desert. It's true in our day as well, isn't it? You look around and and you'll find that many, many, many people, instead of being filled with the meaning and fulfillment and, and peace or shalom that God intended for us to have from the very beginning, people are living with emptiness and loneliness and in a kind of quiet desperation. So perhaps he began his gospel that way to identify with those people. Perhaps he began it that way because there was someone in the desert that Mark wanted us to meet. What a man John the Baptist must have been. He was, by anyone's standards, a strange and eccentric individual. He wore the crudest of clothing, he had an unusual diet, and his personality was raw and blunt. Not the kind of individual that you initially think of as wanting to invite to your Christmas party. And yet, and yet, 
There was something about him. Call it passion, call it integrity, call it his unwillingness to hedge on the truth. Whatever it was, there was something about him that made people want to be around him. So perhaps, perhaps Mark begins his story of the good news of Jesus Christ because he wants us to meet John the Baptist. But you know why I really think he begins his story the way that he begins it? I think he begins it by taking us out into the desert because he wants us to hear the message of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was unlike any preacher most of us have ever heard. As Dr. Fred Craddock points out, his messages were never smooth and, and beautiful. He was no diplomat that made a yes sound like a no and a no sound like a yes in order to please people. He was not a beautiful candle softly lit in a sanctuary. He was instead a prairie fire scorching the earth. He was not a chef offering up fancy dishes. Instead, he simply took the word of God and broke it in his bare hands and said, eat it and live. I think, I think, Mark begins his gospel the way he does because he wants us to hear John's message. What was John the Baptist's message? Mark tells us that he came announcing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And for John, this meant more than simply ritual washings and purification. Now, the ancient Jew was very familiar with symbolic washings and rites of, of purification. It was woven into the very fabric of their communal life. You can go back and read Leviticus chapters 11 through 15 and find the details of this. But for John, the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins meant far more than that. For John, it meant coming clean about who we are and what we are really are. It meant putting away all pretense and sham, any illusion of our innocence that we might pr try to project to other people and simply standing authentically before God. Now on the surface of it, this may sound easy enough, but I think for most of us, it's probably a lot more difficult than it at first sounds because you see, we live in a culture that tells us we are what we look like. One evening this week, try taking a few minutes and just leaf through some of the advertisements that you've received in the mail in preparation for Christmas or, or just simply watch some of the advertisements on the television and see how many times the advertisers tell us you are what you wear. You are the clothes you wear. You are the shoes you buy. You are the makeup you put on. You, you are the jewelry you use to accessorize your outfits. We live in a culture that tells us we are what we own. You want to have value? Build a big bank account. Drive the right kind of car. Own the right home. Purchase the latest gadgets. Then, says our culture, you will have value. We live in a culture that teaches us that we are whatever story we want to tell other people about ourselves. Made mistakes? Don't worry about it. Just simply spin the story the right way and it'll all be okay. In a difficult situation? No problem. Blame other, others for your difficulties. Not who you really want to be? No problem. Just pretend to be whoever it is you really want to be. I've had this in my mind all week long. Earlier in the week, I saw a news story entitled Stolen Valor. You're not going to believe this, but there are people out there who have never served in the armed forces who dress up like soldiers wearing the fatigues and the medals on their, on their chest and, and the whole bit. And they do this in order to receive discounts at the stores or to receive special recognition or, or to simply be noticed by other people. Now, can you believe that? Can you believe that? I trust that none of us who are in here this morning would even think 
of doing that. And yet, it did make me wonder in what sorts of other ways we sometimes try to pretend to be someone or something we are really not. John invites us into an entirely different way. He challenges us to go deeper and trade in our designer clothes for a coat of camel's hair and a leather belt. He invites us to, to leave our nice homes for a little while and to stand in the desert where we have no security other than our complete dependence upon God. He challenges us to, to, to lay aside for a short time all of our makeup and all of our jewelry and all of our false eyelashes. In the early service this morning, I was at this point in my sermon, and after the service, a man came up to me and he said, at that point, you made me just want to take off my coat and tie and just lay it bare. And that's sort of what John the Baptist invites us to do. He challenges us to quit blaming others, take responsibilities, and then stand before a mirror and take a long, hard look at who we are and what we really are. Ironically, John says the moment we do that, the moment we come clean, the moment we put away all pretense, sham, all projections of innocence that, that we have, all of the blaming, the moment we put it all aside and simply see ourselves for who and what we really are, that's the moment when we are prepared to receive the gracious gift that God wants to give us in Jesus Christ. And I think the reason John tells us this is because John knows that we can never really understand what it is Christ can do for us until first we quit conning ourselves into believing that we're self-sufficient. We can never really understand what it is that Christ can do for us until first we recognize our utter and complete need for God. One Sunday morning, during the holidays, a, a, a children's Sunday school teacher was sick and, and called in at the last minute. And so they couldn't find anybody else to substitute. And so they asked the preacher if, if she would do it. And she agreed to do it. She had the time, but she did not have time to prepare for the class. And so when she went in, she just simply sat and talked with the children. And they asked her all sorts of questions. They asked her what it was like to be a preacher. And she tried as best she could to explain that to them. And then they, one little girl asked her, she said, does Santa Claus even come to a preacher's house? <laughs> and, uh, and then one little boy seemed to ask a question that was even more reflective than he realized. Reflecting on the Bible and why it is God seems to appear to some and not to others, he asked, why is it? that God appears to some people and not to others. And for a moment, she scrambled in her mind. How could she explain something so profound to someone so young? And right before she could come up with anything, the little boy answered his own question. He said, I think I know the answer. He said, I think God appears to those who know they really need him. And so he does. You know, the more I think about it, the more I like the way that Mark begins the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe, just maybe, the best way to prepare for the good news of God's redemptive work in our lives is to first pass through the desert and listen to the message of John the Baptist. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is the good news for this morning.